وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The Noble Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims. But there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known. And that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time this book, Power Manifestations of the Seer, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30 including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Zafar Bangash. Welcome to Crescent International Commentary on Global Affairs. Today we are going to look at the issue of Islamophobia and the politics of fear, about which we organized a conference at the Islamic Society of York Region on Saturday, May the 21st. We are going to show you some clips from that conference. And here is the first clip. I introduced the conference. Uh, as well as the invited guest speakers. Now, as you know, we chose this topic, uh, Islamophobia and the politics of fear. And I'm sure that you know that Islamophobia is now unfortunately rampant, not only in North America, but also across Europe. And uh, Muslims are the new enemy. Uh, it seems uh, as if the powers that be instead of presenting something positive, something to bring people together, to unite them, they always want to scare people. And unfortunately, there are many people that can easily be scared because these are the kinds of tactics that politicians and other vested interest groups use in order to harness support for themselves. Ultimately, of course, this kind of fear-mongering turns out to be counterproductive and it, it uh, falls back on them but regrettably there are quite a few unscrupulous people in the world that play on these kinds of fears and they don't want to allow an opportunity or space to create understandings. So what we plan to do this afternoon and this evening is to engage in that dialogue whereby we can explore ways of creating those bridges of understanding. True, we are not going to agree on everything with all the people, and yet it is important that we have a respectful dialogue with each other. We don't have to be enemies, even if we don't see eye to eye with each other. And so in that context, I believe that this afternoon's gathering is extremely important because the speakers that we have invited are people that have been actively engaged in this kind of a process. Our first speaker in the program was Dr. Scott Bader Say, who is Professor of Christian Theology and Moral Ethics at the Seminary of the Southwest in Austin, Texas. Dr. Scott Bader Say dealt with the issue of fear and how it is exploited by various vested interest groups in order to advance their agenda. Here is a brief clip from Dr. Scott Bader Say's speech. How does the culture of fear shape us to respond as fearful people? And therefore, how does it shape us, for instance, to need that gun by our bedside? Um, do we need that gun by our bedside? And perhaps most importantly, what changes in us when we have the gun by our bedside? 
How does it change the way we uh, react to the world or think about the world around us? Uh, as you can see from the title of the book, I, I came to these questions as a Christian theologian. Uh, and so today, I, I speak to you as someone who has, who has reflected on these things primarily from within my own tradition, um, but also as someone uh, who believes that there are, are enough significant overlaps uh, within the Abrahamic traditions, uh, that there are places where I hope um, uh, my own reflections will resonate uh, with your ways of, of, uh, of thinking about and seeing the world and speaking of God uh, and that we will find uh, places where there are analogies and overlaps um, in the ways that we respond to a culture of fear. We had also invited Mozambique, a British citizen and a former detainee at Guantanamo Bay, where he spent three years and then was released without charge, without trial, either in the U.S. or in Guantanamo Bay or anywhere else. In fact, Muazzam has been going around speaking all over the world about the situation in Guantanamo Bay. Unfortunately, he was not allowed to board a flight to Canada, although he was not told that he is inadmissible in Canada. Air Canada, on which he was booked for the flight, told him that they feared that if the flight were to stray over U.S. airspace and the plane had to land in the United States, that there would be security concerns. And it was on this basis that Mozambique was denied boarding on an Air Canada flight to Toronto. So we hooked up with him on Skype in order to at least get the message that he wanted to deliver. Here is Mozam's message over Skype that he delivered to the conference. The other man was the Syrian, was the person they said they sent to Syria. And he was, of course, I realized later, Mahar Arab. And he was tortured and beaten and abused and put in a coffin like prison. And eventually, as you all know, he became one of the most celebrated, most notorious cases of what happened in the war on terror uh, to him. He was uh, compensated eventually uh, and his name was cleared. The British prisoners here have raised a case against the British government for complicity in torture. Last year, we won a big out of court settlement but the case continues in terms of the criminal case that we have pursued in the courts and um, the British intelligence services, the equivalent of your CSIS, are now being investigated by the police. I'll say that again. The British intelligence services, MI5 and MI6, are being investigated by the British police. That is like your Mounties um, interrogating or finding out and investigating criminally the acts of CSIS if they were involved in the torture and the abuse of their own citizens. And this, I think, uh, is also one of the reasons why there is a fear uh, that justice and the exposure to what has been taking place um, is something that we as the former prisoners here, the former Guantanamo prisoners, have instituted and instigated. There was also a government-led inquiry ordered by the new British government under David Cameron into the actions of British intelligence, into the abuse and torture uh, in publicity uh, against their own citizens. Um, so, all of this is part of the fight against Islamophobia, because the only way that we have to help to redress the situation is to say to people, we're not the terrorists, you are. And, I don't mean this just to say words. I just want to tell you, in my mind, what is terrorism? Let's define terrorism. We're always being called terrorists. Let's define it. There are over a hundred different definitions of terrorism, the word terrorism. But it first entered the English language, actually, from the words, the French words, le grand terror, which was the great terror. And that was in uh, the 18th century, when the French Revolution happened, the people who saw the Grand Terror were the ruling elite of Europe. And they said that these revolutionaries are bringing a terror, and that terror to them was democracy. Then this word changed, and it went through all sorts of metamorphoses up until the point today where terrorism is described simply as an individual or organizations. But in fact, previous 
definitions of terrorism show how governments all across history were involved in the use of violence for the attainment of political and religious goals. And that includes governments today. If, and I clearly believe, the usage of um, indiscriminate bombings to kill innocent people is terrorism, which must be condemned, then what do you call the indiscriminate bombing, shooting, pillaging of millions of people across several countries? We had also invited Roy Birkenbosch, who is a teacher at King's University College in Edmonton. Now this particular college, which is a Christian college, uh, took this unusual step of offering to take in Omar Khizr, the Canadian-born citizen who is languishing in Guantanamo Bay since 2002. And Roy Birkenbosch talked about hope and how hope can overcome fear. Here is a clip from the speech that Roy Birkenbosch delivered at the conference. It was in that context that I invited Dennis Idney to come and speak to our students about his defense of Omar Khadr, a Muslim boy that most of our students would never have heard of and about whose life they were probably not interested. But when Dennis told the story of Omar's abuse and torture and of the violation of his rights, and when Dennis drew attention to the inherent dignity of Omar, which his captors and government officials attempted to render invisible, students were able to see this boy no longer as a Muslim terrorist who they might be able to write off then, but rather as a fellow human being. Not as an enemy to be imprisoned and forgotten, but as a neighbor to be appreciated. Not as a prisoner who got what he deserved, but as someone who has been locked away and who needs to be visited and befriended. The story of the injustices done to Omar did not line up with the messages of justice and of reconciliation that they were hearing from their professors. Their education at King's had taught them a different way of seeing the world, not as cursed, but as a place of potential blessing. So they could not hear the story of Omar and then just forget about it and carry on with life as usual. And so they acted. And the students began by holding regular prayers to pray for Omar and to pray for other prisoners at Guantanamo and to pray for Dennis and for his work as a lawyer. They sensed the need to tell Omar's story more broadly. So they organized a rally at Edmonton's Winspear Center in Edmonton, which was attended by uh, hundreds, if not a thousand, citizens. Some faculty became involved as well, supporting students and encouraging them. And that led to students corresponding with Omar and eventually even to some of our faculty, one of our faculty being called as a witness to his sentencing hearing and now to the ongoing work of providing lesson plans, teaching materials, and curriculum to help Omar um, with his education plan, even while he is in prison, so that when he is released, eventually, he will be able to come uh, fully prepared to enter into college or university education, whatever he chooses. And when Omar is released, it's very conceivable that he could become a member of the student body at King's. And if that was possible, what a great day that would be. And what a sign of hope. What a sign of resistance against the cynicism that currently plagues our society. Our keynote speaker at the conference was uh, Dennis Edney, who is the Canadian lawyer for Omar Khizr. Now, Dennis has represented Omar Khizr since 2003 and he goes to Guantanamo Bay on a regular basis. In fact, he's a regular fixture at Guantanamo Bay because Dennis Edney believes that he cannot abandon Omar Khizr, who was forced to confess to a crime that he had not committed. And so here is what Dennis Edney talked about in his speech, which is very long, but we're just going to show you a clip. My final story is out of Omar Khadr. His story and his life in Guantanamo Bay reflects the failure of civil society, which is us, 
its institutions, which is our churches, whether it's Christian, Jewish, Muslim, they're all, in my view, long thrown in together. And it's people, all of us, to speak out in ensuring our shared values, because we're decent people. We try to live decent lives. We try to bring our kids up well. So we want, it's a failure of us to speak out in ensuring our shared values of a just society are carried out. You know, it was in January of 2002 we first saw the shocking images of human beings in rows in aircraft hooded and shackled for transportation across the Atlantic, much as other human beings had been carried in slave ships 400 years earlier. We witnessed the captors humiliating these anonymous human beings and boarded at Guantanamo Bay, crouched in open cages in orange jumpsuits, all de de deliberately displayed for the world to see. Many of you, many of you saw that on TV. And amongst them, when you think back to when you saw that on TV, amongst them was a young boy, a young Canadian boy, Omar Khadr. And I say to you, for each and every one of you, for the watching world, who saw those images on television, no knowledge of international, international humanitarian law was needed to, to be understood. You knew intuitively that what you were witnessing was unlawful. This was not a manifestation of the Geneva Conventions at work, nor was it an act of deportation or an act of extradition. It was far worse. It was the unlawful transportation to a world outside the reach of the law, and it was intended to remain so. In that world, crimes against inhumanity were to be carried out in Guantanamo Bay under a conspiracy or a curtain of silence. Now, Guantanamo has been called everything from an offshore concentration camp to a legal black hole. It has become a symbol of much that is wrong with our society. It is a complex of brutal prisons where hundreds of men and children from all over the world have been held there under incredibly inhuman conditions and incessant interrogations. I can tell you, I have been human. I went to Guantanamo Bay as a lawyer who had lots of experience in doing some pretty big trials and I've represented some people that you wouldn't like to bring home. So I thought I was a tough constitutional criminal lawyer. But when I went to Guantanamo Bay and I came out of there, I changed forever. I'm driven. I think when I sit with my kids and we're having a nice dinner and my wife has prepared something nice, I remind my kids what takes place while we're eating. And I could tell you what goes on in Guantanamo this very night. I can't avoid it. It's a place without rules. And it's a place where a Canadian, Omar Khadr, has spent a quarter of his life. He was 15 when he went there. We hope you found this presentation informative and we hope that uh, we will present to you other segments, not only of this conference, but of other issues that confront the Muslim Ummah in its troubled history as we go through these very, very troubled times. That's all for today. You've been watching Crescent International Commentary on Global Affairs. I'm Zafar Bangash. Thank you for watching. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. كلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم
The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The noble messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries for the first time this book power manifestations of the seer examining the letters and treaties of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam discusses this crucial topic in detail The book is now available at a special price of $30 including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0 or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today.